song is indescribable. So just praise, praise Jesus with me. <laughs> give whatever you would have us to give. 
Lord, I just thank you for this time that you've given us together. Lord, I just ask that every step we would make, every word we would say would be an offering that just smells beautiful to you. So, Lord, thank you. We just our prayer. Amen.
leave this building the way that we came in. But we'll go with a greater understanding of who you are, how you want to protect, how you love us, and how you want us to share that Thank you. You may be seated. Thank you, Miss Mark. Thank you, Andrew, for leading us in worship. Al and Tiffany are are not feeling well. They uh, are coming home this weekend. They got sick on the way home, so that's why Andrew is here this morning. We want to, at this moment, transition to our children. So, if uh, you are here between four years old and sixth grade, we want to let you go out with the adults and. Uh, the lessons they have prepared for you. If you're staying with us, go ahead and grab your bulletin and, and look on the back of the bulletin. Uh, I've got notes there for you. You can keep them there. Um, all right, so they are out. This year, God has convicted me about being bold. And so the theme for this year, you're going to see this for you. I hope you dream about the words bold, but it's about being bold. And so we're going to open up this year with a series called Bold Vision. And I want to recalibrate, if you will. I want to go back and, and, and revisit the, the vision here at New Heights Church, Vision Leaks. And I want to share with you um, what our call is, what our purpose is. We want to revisit the win-win, what our definition of wins are here at our church. And, and just to start out, I thought it would be a perfect place to start out reminding ourselves of why God has us here. Because for me, it's real easy for Mark Elkins to get caught up in buildings. It's real easy for me to get so focused on we need a building and we need that materialistic thing that, we, that I lose focus on what the real reason New Heights is here. And so I want to, to get myself on that mind, mind track, but I also want to get you guys thinking the same way. If you remember, our, our mission is loving Jesus, loving others, and serving both. And how do we do that? By loving Jesus, by loving others, and serving both. It's a vision, but it's also the how-to thing. Um, if you remember, our win-win is making disciples that make disciples. And we're going to get into how we do that as well. If you don't attend church here today, if you don't attend here regularly, I want you to know something. What I've got for you today, it's going to carry about whether you are a Christ follower or not. It's going to help you to, with your life, with success or not. So how do you define success? How do you, how do you determine if you're successful? How do you know whether you're winning or losing? How do you know if you hit a home run? Well, in the book of Exodus chapter 6, if you've got your Bible, I hope you do, go ahead and be turning there right now. The book of Exodus chapter 6. We're going to look there today for what God has, has given us on how we can determine that, how we can define that. But in this particular passage, it's before, or actually it's, it's immediately following Moses with the burning bush. If you remember, Moses had a burning bush experience. He was on the backside of the desert. And, and God spoke to him through a bush that was on fire, but it didn't burn. And God said, this is what I want you to do. Go and set my people free. And so Moses leaves, and as he's leaving, he runs into his brother Aaron, and they reunite. And Moses declares to Aaron what God has spoken to him about. And Moses catches the vision, and, or Aaron catches the vision, and, and he's good with it. He's on fire with it. And then as they're on their way, God speaks to Moses again. And God restates, he reinforces this vision. He reiterates it of what God wants to do. And so here it is. Exodus chapter 6, verse 6. <clears throat> It says, therefore, say to the children of Israel, I am the Lord. I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. I will rescue you from their bondage. I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great judgments. I will take you as my people and I will be your God. Then you will know that I am the Lord your God who brings you out from under the burdens of Egypt or of the Egyptians. There are four I wills here that I want to focus on. And I want to, I want to do this to a great extent. I want to get into it. I want to get detailed with it. You see, this is a really important passage. This is a passage that the Jewish people would use before they would do the Passover. Before they took up the Passover, they would state this verse. They would repeat this verse. They would read this verse out loud. And, and, and they would focus on these I wills. Jesus did this the night before he was betrayed, when he took the last supper with, with his disciples. 
We do something similar when we do the Lord's Supper. It's very similar to this, but when the, when they, when the Jews would eat the Passover, they would drink a cup of wine with each I will, totaling four cups. You see, there's four cups. There are four things. There are four phases that God wants every person to go through. That God, that, that God is working in every person's life. Listen, this is so powerful to me. It's found in the Great Commission. I have preached this in the New Testament. And, and up until this moment, I didn't realize that, it, that this was not only the New Testament, but this has been with God from the beginning. This is the heart of God. And it should be our heart as well. And I need you to do something today. I'm going to tell you right now, I'm going to repeat it at the end. I need you to complete these four phases. I need you, after you've heard this message today, to, to make that agreement with yourself and with the Lord that you will go through these four phases. And once you've gone through them, I need you to commit to taking somebody else through them. This is so important. This is so imperative. I can't emphasize it enough. You see, success is moving people. That's what success is. People need to move. People need to get where they are and get to the Lord. Can I get a witness? And then once they've found the Lord, they need to get from where they are in the Lord and grow deeper and deeper and deeper toward the Lord. They need to move from this to this and from that to that until they continue to grow this. They develop this really deep relationship with God. If we stop moving, what happens to us? We become stagnant. We become stale. Think about it. Relationships. When relationships stop growing, they become stagnant and stale. That's what happens to marriages. When marriage stops growing, it becomes stagnant and stale. You start having marital problems. We as Christians, when we stop moving toward God, we become stagnant and stale. Come on. I'm talking to somebody right now. And God wants us to move. We need to be a people who are willing to move. Some of you need some next lights. Can I get a witness? <laughs> this is why we named this church New Heights. We want to take people to new heights for Jesus. We want to grow people toward Jesus where they can be like Jesus. So here are the four phases. The first phase is this. Sanctification. The first phase is sanctification. The word sanctification literally means to bring out. All right? To bring out. And, and so the first I will, God says, I will what? Bring you out. You need to underline that. You need to, read, you need to underscore that, circle that, whatever you want to call it. I need to bring you out. God says, I will bring you out from Egypt. We also call this salvation. When we get saved, God brings us out of our lifestyle. God saves us from how we're living, from what we're doing. And we have this relationship with God. And, he, and now we know that we are going to heaven. But I want you to know something. Most people don't come to Jesus for a, a get-out-of-card free, a free get-out-of-hell card. That's not why they come to Jesus. The reason they come to Jesus is because they're exhausted. They're worn out. They're troubled. They're tired. They're beaten down. They're messed up. They're burdened with life. The stuff that the world has to offer is burdensome. It's overwhelming. It weighs us down. What we're doing right now should be a place where people who are yoked in bondage can come and be set free. Not to hit this way. Come on. It should be a place for people of whatever they're going through in their life. It shouldn't really matter what they look like or smell like or act like. They should be able to walk into this environment and be set free. Not yoke down, but experience the freedom of the Lord. Jesus said this way, you must be born again. You must be born again. You must go through this experience of salvation or that you've committed your life, you've surrendered your life to Jesus. You must go through this sanctification process where God brings you out of what you once were doing into this new life. This new life that is created in Him. We are new creatures in Christ. We are a new creation in Christ. The second phase is deliverance. Second phase, phase two is deliverance. Lots of people experience salvation. Lots of people experience sanctification. This is being brought out. But few people actually make it through the process of deliverance. Few Christians actually get through the process of deliverance. Now hear me. 
Once you're saved, you have all of Christ. The finished work of the cross is applied to your life. Now understand what I'm saying. Once you're saved, God has given you all of Him. The problem is we haven't given God all of us. Can I get the witness to that? We hide things in our heart. We hide issues in our heart. We, we don't totally surrender this. Our finances, number one, certain relationships, certain things in our life. We don't want to give up. And so God is saying, listen, I have saved you. But now I want to deliver you. You, you have this, this salvation. You have this sanctification. But now I'm asking you to go through the process of being delivered. And I dare say the overwhelming majority of our church, not just this church, but churches in general, are hung up in this process. You see, God says, I've taken you out of Egypt, but now I need to get Egypt out of you. You are no longer a slave, so I, gotta, I need you to quit thinking like a slave. I need you to quit acting like a slave. I need you to quit behaving like a slave. The truth is, there's a whole bunch of people going to heaven. The problem is, they're not enjoying their salvation right now. They're not enjoying their life right now. Salvation cannot be earned. Am I right? You cannot work to be saved. The Bible says, for by grace, you have been saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Now, don't hear what I'm not saying. You can't work your way into heaven. But there's a whole bunch of us right now that aren't enjoying the journey here on earth because we're still acting like we did before we got saved. We're still believing like we believed before we met Jesus. When sin calls your name, you answer. You respond. And it's our thinking. God wants to deliver us from thinking the way we think. We need a whole lot of deliverance. We all have a little... I mean, we just are messed up. You know, we're just all messed up. And God says, I want to set you free. I want to get you out of Egypt. And once I've gotten you out of Egypt, I want to get Egypt out of you. I want to deliver you from Egypt. I want to deliver you from things like anger. I want to deliver you from things like your financial mountain. You're, you're all messed up financially. I want to deliver you from things like depression. I want to deliver you from things like guilt. I want to set you free from your shame and your failures and all those things that you've experienced in life. I want to deliver you from that. I want you to enjoy your life. The third phase is redemption. And I'd say that more than 90% of our church never make it here. We never make it here. And I'll get into why in just a minute. But all of our church, get this, all of the church is saved, right? And yet, the majority of our church, we're like a roller coaster ride. Up and down. Do you know anybody that one moment they're excited, they're great, everything is wonderful, and the next moment they're down in the dumps? The next week they're, they're in the gutter, they just can't get out of it? You know, I mean, their life is like, woo, woo, woo. You know, there's not consistent. They're not all these things that they've been experiencing. There's no finality to it. There's no end to it. God's not setting me free from it. They've not gone through the process of deliverance. They've never been delivered. And once we get delivered, God says this to us. Listen, it's not over. It says, I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great judgments. Listen to what this word redeem means. This word redeems means to put back in its original place. To put, back, to put back for its original purpose. God wants to put you back for what He originally intended for you to do. God's saying, I want to bring you back to what I intended you to do to begin with. I want to get you back in that place where that you can do what you were supposed to do. So you can experience your original purpose. Your Israel's original purpose was never slavery. Yours was never to be enslaved to sin. Mine was never being slave for sin. Listen, it's not good enough for God to get you out of your Egypt. Don't get me wrong. Salvation is awesome. Salvation is a great thing. Can I get a witness? But that's not the end. It's just the beginning. It's not good enough for God to get Egypt out of you. Don't get me wrong. I want to be delivered. I want to experience this deliverance from my habits and my vices and, and all these things. Don't get me wrong. I want that. But that's not the end. I want to get to that place in my life where I'm doing what God called me to do. 
where I'm being what God called me to be. I want to find my purpose in life. But hear me. In order for that to happen, you've got to be broken. Ow. And some of you right now are running from being broken. You're fighting with all of you got to fight because you don't want to be broken. You don't want to be empty. You don't want to have this or not have that. And here's the deal. In order for us to get what God wants us to have, God has to put us back together. But in order for God to put us back together, we got to be broken. In order for God to fill your vessel, your vessel has to be what? Empty. If your vessel is full, you ain't getting much of God. You understand what I'm saying? God says, I want to redeem you. I want to put you back together the way that I intended for you to be to begin with. To do the thing that I wanted you to do. Turn to your neighbor and say, it's not enough. Come on, say it with conviction. It's not enough. What my life has right now is not enough. I enjoy my salvation, but God wants to give me more than just being saved. Salvation is not enough. I enjoy being delivered, but being delivered is not enough. I want to do, I want to be who God called me to be and what God called me to do. That's where I, that's where I want to get to. Now listen to me. Look what it says. I will redeem you with an outstretched arm. Hear this. You know what it means? It means God's got his arm and he's going to take you way. He's going to reach out with his arm way over there. You're way over there in the place that he never intended for you to be. But he's going to come over to where you are with his outstretched arm. And he's going to lovingly pick you up. And he's going to place you here where he wants you to be. Some of you are going through things in life and you're like, God, why am I experiencing all of this? Why am I feeling all of this? Why am I having to deal with all of this? And God's saying the reason is because you're way over here. I never intended for you to be there. I never intended for you to go through that. I never intended for you to experience that. I'm going to have to reach with my outstretched arms to where you are and lift you up and bring you back where I want you to be. Man, that's pretty awesome. I was thinking I'd ask some hallelujahs, amen, to go mark with that kind of thought. Because that's pretty stinking awesome, man. Some of you can't even think this way. Some of you don't even realize that God has greatness in store for you. You are made in the image of God. That means that you are made with greatness in mind. But you can't think that way because you are way over here and you're experiencing all of these failures and all of these disasters and all, and all you know is failure. And so you're thinking, there's nothing great inside of me. And you're right. Where you are, there's nothing great. But God wants to pick you up and put you to a place where that you are great. Write this down. Psalm 18. I'm giving you a homework assignment. Go back and read Psalm 18. It's David writing about his failures. How God turned his failures to successes. Because God's greatness was upon him. We need to listen to that. And we need to recognize that God has his arm ready to reach us at any moment. Ready to redeem us at any moment. And pull us back into this greatness. And we simply just need to let him do that. And we simply just need to receive, okay God, you want to make me great. Make me great. I want to be great for you. Here we go. I'm not done yet. It says, I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great judgment. And with great judgment. I want you to get this. Circle that word, great judgment. God's judgments aren't for the Christ follower. If you are a Christian today, I want you to know something. That God stored up His wrath for you and He placed it on His Son at the day of Calvary. That God's anger and that God's wrath and God's judgment was given to Jesus Christ the day that He was crucified for you and me. The judgment of God is not for you. God loves you. I know that you're probably going through some difficulties in your life, but it's because we've got a real enemy. Get ready to get that in just a minute too. But God loves you. God loves me. He has blessings in mind for you and me. And He wants to give you those things. The judgments are to the one who is obstructing His will. The judgments are coming to the one who are obstructing or keeping God's blessings on your life. And that's the devil. That's the devil and his army. And they will do anything they can to keep you from experiencing God's blessings. 
to keep you from giving God glory. They'll do everything they can to keep you from experiencing God's purpose in your life. God wants to set you free from your addictions. God wants to set you free from distractions. God wants to set you free from depressions. God wants to set you free from all of these vices that are in your life that are keeping you from Him. And Satan will do whatever he can to keep you from experiencing that. To keep you from walking that wall and feeling that and knowing that. Hear me. God is committed to you. He wants you to find your purpose. But hear this. Your world, our world, the world is depending on you and me finding God's purpose. Hear this. Your world needs you living what God intended for you to be. Your world needs you being that person that God created you to be. Your world needs you doing the things that God called you to do, that God purposed in your life for you to do. Your world needs that. We impact our world when we live a redeemed life. We, live, we impact our world by simply living a redeemed life. Most of you are saved. Most of you are sanctified. And, and you're living in this time of deliverance. But I'm asking you to grow up. I'm asking you to move from deliverance to redemption. To let God redeem you so that you can find your purpose. And the last phase, the fourth phase, fourth phase is this. Is praise. The fourth phase is praise. Now, if you remember, I told you that, a, that the Jews drank a glass of wine every time they said, I will. So you can imagine after four glasses of wine, there was some praise going on, you know? Right? Okay, so you think it's funny. All right, sorry. <laughs> Listen, praise. It's, a, it's the cup. It's the moment that we sing hallelujah. It, 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 it's where we get the word hallelujah. The word hallelujah means to celebrate. It's where it's, we get to that point in life where we celebrate what Jesus has done for us. We celebrate how God has, has saved us, has sanctified us, how God has, has delivered us, how God has redeemed us, and we're living a life of redemption. We're living a life of purpose, and we're living in all purpose, and we walk with joy. How many of you have your joy robbed by your circumstances in your life? How many of you feel you know, down and discouraged in your life? And God says, that's not for me. I want you to be joy-filled. I want you to sing hallelujah. I don't want your circumstance to change how you feel. What you're going through. And God says, this is the moment where you can celebrate me, what I have done for you. Do you know that hallelujah, no matter what language you speak, hallelujah means the same thing? You can, If you don't know any other language, just go up to somebody and say hallelujah. And you're telling them, I'm thanking Jesus for what Jesus has done for me. I'm celebrating Jesus and what Jesus has done for me. And we need to get to that life. And God says, I'm going to bring you out of Egypt. And then I'm going to get Egypt out of you. And then I'm going to redeem you. I'm going to bring you together. I'm going to put you back together the way I intend you to be for the purpose that you, that you have. And then look at verse 7. It says, I will take you as my people, and I will be your God. What does praise that my people have, have in common? You see, we need to celebrate what God has done to us and through us in these first three phases. And then that we become this part of a family, this community. This God-oriented people. We're living fulfilled lives because of what God has done in the first three phases. And we're experiencing the joy by now walking in that celebration. God's ultimate plan for you is to be happy. Do you know that? God's ultimate plan for you is to be fulfilled. God's ultimate plan is for you to make a difference in your world. And He wants your life, in your life, for you to experience His joy. So that you can be saved and delivered and redeemed. This is success. Moving from Egypt to freedom. Moving from slavery to freedom. Moving to, to a place where that we're doing life God's way. You know, the world's way of living really becomes burdensome. I, I hear this a, a lot from our, our youth. I can't wait until I get old enough that I can drink all that I want to drink. And I look at them and I smile. I'm like, are you crazy? Why would you want to get so drunk that you put your face where your behind was just a couple of hours ago? 
That's not freedom. Believe me, I've been there. I've experienced that. That's not freedom. Freedom is living our life the way God has called us to live it. To be the person that God has called us to be. And my goal is for every person to go to new heights for God. For every person to go to new heights with Jesus. And the ultimate height is to live fulfilled lives. The ultimate high, high, uh, height is to experience His glory and to bring in and experience His joy, to be a part of His family. And we don't need to stop till we get here. So how do we do that here at this church? First thing we do is we love Jesus. And this is part of loving Jesus. And when we do our, our, our events, we love Jesus. At basketball, we want to love people like Jesus loves people, right? We want people to feel the freedom. When we come in and we worship, and we come into the, into the part of God's kingdom, we accept salvation. We receive His salvation. And, 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 and we take the membership class. We become a member of a church. We become a member of a people. That's our first step. That's our first phase here at New Heights. Our second phase is not really a whole lot different. We take our second level class, that the just discovering um, maturity, and we learn how to pray. We learn how to read our Bible. We become self. We, we, we start our small groups, and, and we get plugged into our small groups. I want to say this something, guys, real quick. If you're not connected with a small group, there's a really good chance that you're going to leave this church. Because that's how we get connected here at church. If you're not connected with a small group, you're not going to stay here very long, most likely at all. If you're not delivered, there's a really good chance that you're, it's because you're not a part of a small group. The issues that you have, the way that you get delivered from those issues, small groups are the perfect environment for you to get delivered. Listen to me. If you think that you can come and counsel with me and that I can help you be delivered, not that you're crazy. First of all, I'm not a counselor. I'll tell you exactly what I think. That's not how counselors do it. Second of all, I'm only one person. I can only see so many people a day, and, and, and I can't even hold you accountable. You see, when I preach this sermon, I'm giving you assignments, but I can't tell if you've done it or not. Are you going to go back and read Psalm 17? I don't know. But if you're a part of a small group, you get that right to be held accountable, and you have earned the right to be honest with people, and people can get you get your Egypt out of you. The Bible says to work out your own salvation. It doesn't say that you have to work to get saved. It says once you're saved, then you start working that out. And the way we do that here in this church is through small groups. Some of you said, Pastor, I need you to feed me. I need you to feed me. Go deeper. Go deeper. Listen, the way you go deeper is with small groups. So I'm pushing that. Can you say, can you tell I'm pushing that today? I'm pushing that. Loving Jesus is it's here at worship. Loving others, we get involved with each other's lives. We get involved with small groups. And, and, and we start learning how to be a disciple. The, also, the, the, the third class is also comes to mother's loving Jesus. It's called Discovering Ministry. That's the class that helps us to determine where God has gifted us. Where and how God has gifted us and who God has called us to be. Listen to this verse in Ephesians 4. But to each one of us, underline this word... Grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. You see, God wants you to turn into a prismatic. Does that make you uncomfortable? God wants to make you charismatic. You know what charismatic literally means? That word grace is charismatic. It means God has gifted you to do something well. How many of you like preachers with a lot of energy? Woohoo! They enjoy themselves, right? You enjoy coming into a place where, people, where a pastor enjoys what he's doing. God has that same drive for you. God's got a call in your life and, for your pur and a purpose for you for that you experience that same excitement, that same energy. And look, it's found in that same Ephesians 4, verse 11. It says that He Himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors, and some teachers. Why? For the equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry. You see, your calling is imperative for New Heights Church to be successful. You getting to this place where they, you understand what you're doing, it's imperative. We need people redeemed where they understand what they're doing and so they can live that life so that we, we can't afford to hire somebody else here. There's only one of me and we can't afford to hire someone else. We need you doing what God's called you to do. Being who God's called you to be. About people. So here's your assignment for this year. Everybody is in a phase. 
Everybody is somewhere on this chart. And I'm asking you to be a part of our success by committing to the Lord today. Some of you, you, you may not, you may still be in your Egypt. You may still be lost. And I believe that God is asking you here today saying, listen, I sent my son to die for your sin. But you come out of Egypt. Some of you, you're out of Egypt, but Egypt isn't out of you. And God's saying, I'm asking you to start putting legs to your prayers and get involved with some kind of ministry where that I can get these habits out of you, where people will hold you accountable, where that you can lose your anger, where that you can lose your lust, where that you can lose your whatever. And be the person that I've called you to be. Some of you have dealt with that. You've been delivered, but now it's time for you to be redeemed. God wants to pick you up where you are and put you in a spot that's next to Him and put you back together so that you can do what God's called you to do. So that you can be who God has called you to be. To experience His freedom. And then others, you may already be there. You know where you go? Then you need to go back and take someone through those phases. Walk someone to the Lord. Come along beside of that person and get Egypt out of them. Come along beside of someone else and get them to the place where they found their purpose and their calling. If you'll see the title here, it says move or help me move. That's my conviction. I hope it would be a little bit humorous to you, but at the same time, there's always a little truth to sarcasm, right? I'm totally committed to this. Convicted of this. Church, I need your help. Will you move? Or will you help me move? Let's get on the ball today. Let's get on the stick today. This year, about fulfilling the very things that God's called us to feel. He's created you for a reason. And it's more than just coming and sitting in that chair on Sunday morning. And I love that you're here. Don't get me wrong. I want you here. Don't get me wrong. We need you to come on Sunday morning. Don't hear what I'm not saying. But there's more to life and there's more to worship than you just coming here on Sunday morning and doing sitting in that chair. There's more ministry. Your world needs you to do what God has called you to do. To be who God has called you to be. To be. The question is, make that step today? Will you make that minute today? Let's pray. Father, thank you for this day. And again, I say thank you for this time, for this moment. This has been one of those messages that's not been easily preached. But Lord, I believe with all my heart that you're convicting and you're calling us to do what you have called us to do, to be who you called us to be. Our churches are in a place that they are because We've missed it. We've been robbed. We've, we've had it taken from us. Or we believe something else. And today, God, I'm asking you to speak to each and every individual. And that they would hear you. And they would respond in obedience to making that commitment this year to getting to that next level. Moving into salvation, into sanctification, of moving from that to being delivered, moving from deliverance to redemption, and then from redemption to praise. Say hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. I'm going to live my life now in a way that helps others experience what you've allowed me to experience. With every head bowed, every eyes closed. So someone here today said, Pastor, that's me. I'm ready today to make that commitment. Would you just raise your hand? I'm ready today to make that commitment. I want to move. God bless you. God bless you. I want to get to the next place in my life. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Pastor, I'm ready. I'm, I'm tired of fighting the same fight. I've not been delivered. I've been fighting to be delivered. And I'm ready to be delivered today. I'm ready to be delivered this year. Somebody raise their hand. Anybody? I uh, you know the hearts, you know the minds, you know the souls of each person that's here. Let's <laughs> pray. Those that raise their hand, God, you will make the way. That you would show them. 
the way, your way, to that next level, to that next place in the relationship with you. To grow them, mature them. May we be Christ. May we love like Jesus. May we forgive like Jesus. May we give like Jesus. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Would you all stand and as we sing this song, you may need to come and pray or want to come and pray. Put this into our altar. If you feel the need to come and pray about your commitment to the Lord this year, would you come?